put it before to um, that I will be talking about potential universal vaccines. A summary of my talk is that the good news is that if we will be mice or ferrets, we will be we will have a vaccine against flu. However, but uh, <laughs> we are not mice, we are not ferrets, and the proof will be into seeing whether actually this approach that we are using works in humans. And I'm going to be focused mainly on the approach that we are using, and by we, I mean the group in Mount Sinai, which is my lab, together with Peter Palacio and Florian Kramer. And there are other approaches that I think they are also very good for improving influenza virus vaccines, but I'm not going to discuss them. Later on, we can discuss during the dinner or, or at any other time. All right, and as a disclosure, some of the studies are funded by GSK. Uh, we have a research agreement, and I've been mentoring patents on universal flu vaccine. All right, so we have heard already about influenza, so we, I can, I can w work a little bit uh, uh, quickly on here. Um, the important thing, um, the important part in my talk is going to be focused on this protein of the virus, the hemagglutinin. And this protein is the target for neutralizing antibodies that are the basis why natural infection induce uh, immunity that is for life that prevent infection with the same strain of influenza virus and is also the basis for the work of the vaccines, induction of neutralizing antibodies that binds to the hemagglutinin and prevents binding of the hemagglutinin to the receptor, gallic acid containing receptor. So the complexity with flu is that although these antibodies are very good for neutralizing, are very good to prevent infection with the same strain, is that the strains change from year to year. That's what we know about antigenic drift. And then we have in total now circulating in influenza virus four different, different antigenically different influenza viruses. Two influenza B viruses that they were segregated into two lineages, Yamagata and Victoria, that are antigenically now distinct. And then we have circulating in humans right now H1N1s and H3N2s, hemagglutinin type 1, hemagglutinin type 3, antigenically very different. And that's the reason why the majority of the flu vaccines are now tetravalent before they were trivalent with only one big component. The vaccine needs to be updated almost every year because at least one of the strains, one of the, one of the B strains or one of the H1 or H3 has changed enough that now it needs to be antigenically updated in order to induce the right immunity against the new strain. And this is a challenge for the annual seasonal vaccination for influenza to be able to come out with the vaccine that antigenically match the circulating strains that are four different uh, four different strains. In addition, we have the problem that influenza viruses, A viruses, come as pandemics from time to time. And when they come as pandemics, then there is the complete change, antigenic change of the hemagglutinin. And this there's even less pre-existing immunity against these new strains in humans. And that's one of the reasons why this pandemic virus in general are so successful. And um, as I mentioned, we have no idea which is going to be the next pandemic virus. There is a total of 16 potential uh, hemagglutinin subtypes with all potential different strains between these uh, hemagglutinin subtypes. We don't know which one is the one that is going to uh, cause the next pandemic, and the only thing that we know is that there will be an, a, another pandemic. That's the only thing that we are sure about. And here there are just some examples of different strains that are continuously infecting humans, but they have not been able to tr establish transmission cycles in humans. Whether they will be able or not, that's a question that we don't know and whether it will be a completely different virus, like for example, in all H, another H1 and 2, that they are still circulating in avians, that they were, it's, it's certainly possible for an H2 and 2 to cause a pandemic. They did it in 1957. That could be the next pandemic, or maybe not. And we have these viruses circulating in, as, as Ab alluded, in, in many different hosts, and then what could be the next one is a completely unpredictable at this moment um, for us. Now, what we know is what happened when a new pandemic virus arises, when one of these uh, viruses that is in the reservoir comes with a new antigenically subtype uh, for a hemagglutinin and then gets into human and starts transmission to human in human. And this is what happened in 1957 from a WHO paper from September 1957 and illustrates how quickly these viruses, one day uh, originate as human viruses, they're able to propagate. So the virus was first identified in February 1957, here at Southeast China. And then by May, it spreads to a, a large geographical area, Oceania, 
all uh, Southeast Asia, India, China, Japan, and then by August, it just was all over the world. And that was in 1957, where there was less, uh, certainly, humans traveling from country to country, like today, and less density in the human population. So, for example, when the pandemic 2009 vaccine, uh, the virus came, um, the vaccine that was made didn't make any impact at all in the first wave of uh, viral infections. And these are data from, uh, from the United States where they saw that the first wave and peak of infections during the pandemic 2009 was around October of 2009. And at this time is when, with the techni technology that we have right now, is when a vaccine was prepared, was made, and started to be shipped for vaccination based on this pandemic H1N1 viruses. Now, the, uh, enough amount of vaccine doses were available now to vaccinate all the people several months later. And then this decrease that was in the cases incidences during the first wave of the pandemic 2009 didn't have anything to do with vaccination against 2009. It was just the natural way that the first wave went away and then there came a second wave. This vaccine was able to make an impact for the second wave for the people that were vaccinated, but not, not nothing at all during the first wave. And you need to have in mind also that this is when they were ready but then still you require at least one month to elicit the protective immunity against the virus. So the technology that we have right now is not good enough in order to prevent the first wave of a pandemic virus once that starts in humans. Now and the question is, can, can we make a, a vaccine that will be able to protect against strains that we don't know which ones are going to be in the future? And um, this is a possibility if we try to target conserved areas of the virus for which an immune response will be able to protect against multiple strains and all subtypes of the virus because they have the same conserved epitopes, conserved areas. Uh, and the approach that I'm going to be talking about is in the vaccine strategy that focus into induction of antibodies against the stem region of the hemagglutinin. So here is the hemagglutinin of the virus, a crystal structure of a monomer. And this part is uh, that is the majority of it is the HA1, but also contains some part of the HA2. This is what is, is called the head of the hemagglutinin. This other part is the stem of the hemagglutinin. The membrane, the viral envelope is here. Viral infection and vaccination with existing vaccines induce antibodies against the head. These are immunodominant epitopes that they are in, they are in the head. And these are actually the places where the virus change. The place the head is very different between different subtypes of the virus. And also the immunodominant epitopes of the head are changing from year to year with antigenic drift. So these antibodies are very good to protect against the same strain, but are not good to protect it against other strains, drifted strains or shifted strains. Around 10 years ago, people started to isolate, multiple groups started to isolate from humans antibodies that they were directed against this other region of the hemagglutinin. These antibodies are not very prevalent, but you can find B cells that produce them isolated from humans. And once that you, that they, be, they, they become available and you can characterize them, then these antibodies are protective. And not only are protective, but they are also against an area that is quite concerned for influenza viruses. Now, the mechanism of action of these antibodies is not by preventing binding to the receptor, but it will be by preventing either fusion or um, extrusion of the virus, and also they are very good in, in, in uh, initiating and inducing antibody-dependent effect of mechanisms, such, such as antibody-dependent cytotoxicity or antibody-dependent opsonization, and this is in contrast with antibodies against the head that are not so good as in the induction of this effect of mechanism of antibodies. So these antibodies, they have been shown to be able to be protective in uh, multiple animal models, the problem is that, uh, again, these antibodies, they are being, getting induced with very low um, percentage due to the immunodominance of the head. So in order to, if one will induce these antibodies, we need to have into consideration also that there are two types of hemagglutinins according also to the phylogenetic phylo relationship and that antibodies against the stem of one hemagglutinin, group one hemagglutinin, Rarely, very rarely, and these are very rare antibodies, but the majority of the antibodies against the stem of this group one will not neutralize or will not protect against the stem two uh, from group two or vice versa. 
So if we think about a vaccine that is based on antibodies against the stem of the hemagglutinin, we need to have three components in this, in this vaccine, trivalent vaccine, will be a stem from group one of influenza A, a stem of group two from influenza A, and a stem of influenza B virus that has also a stem that is antigenically different from the stem of uh, group one and group two influenza A viruses. But antibodies against, against group one neutralized very well uh, all of these different hemagglutinin subtypes. They include the H1s, the H5s, the H9s. Um, and then antibodies against group two will neutralize uh, the H3s that are circulating as well as the H7s, for example. All right, so how we can design a vaccine that overcomes the immunodominance of the head and induce large amount of antibodies against the stem? There are basically two approaches, and they are both valid. The fair approach is the use of headless constructs. Headless constructs are constructs, hemagglutinin constructs, in which the head is being chopped. You just chop the head, and then you have an antigen that is only based on the stem. Without the immunodominance of the head, these stem-based immunogens, they induce good immunity against the stem. The problem with this approach, which uh, can be overcome, is that if you chop the head of the hemagglutinin, it happens the same thing as if they chop the head of us. It just fall apart. So the, the HA is a trimer. You chop the head, and then all this trimer falls apart. And most of the antibodies that are working against the stem are against the trimer, conformational specific. Now, we heard um, already from Michelle that there are ways how you can take with an immunogen, stabilize um, the immunogen, and then being able now to get by modifications something that rest, uh, retain the structure, like it happened with the F uh, protein, perfusion protein of RSV. And in fact, the VRC has come with a stabilized stem by putting modifications in the stem that make it more stable, as well as the Scripps group, uh, Ian Wilson has come also, with a stem that is uh, stabilized, at least for group one, and there is also hope that that will be possible for group two and influenza B. And these are, these are good approaches, I think. It's, um, the one that I'm gonna talk is the one that we are using in Sinai, which is different from this one. And this is based on what we call chimeric hemagglutinins. And we use repeat vaccination, sequential vaccination, at least two times or three times with chimeric hemagglutinins, what we call chimeric hemagglutinins. And again, it's a, it's a um, collaboration between the groups of Peter Palese, my group, and the group of Florian Kramer at um, Mount Sinai. So what are these chimeric hemagglutinins? The chimeric hemagglutinins are hemagglutinins in which the head is being replaced. So we don't chop the head of the hemagglutinin, we just change the head of the hemagglutinin with an exotic head. We have a total of 16 different exotic heads um, from different antigenic types. If we include the, the bad ones, then we, then we have a total of 18. And these hemagglutinins in which you replace the head of the hemagglutinin but conserve the same stem, they are perfectly functional. You can make viruses that grow similar to Walter virus, a little bit attenuated in, in animals. <laughs> and these viruses can be uh, propagated in substrates that are being used for the normal uh, production of flu vaccines, for example, in order to make inactivated vaccines, or in order to make life attenuated vaccines. And again, these antigens can also be expressed in baculo or could be expressed with vectors. So the antigens are uh, platform agnostic in terms of vaccination. These are the chimeric hemagglutinins. And the concept that we have is that we start vaccination with a chimeric hemagglutinin. In this case, it's a vaccination with one that contains the stem from H3 and the head of H4. And this is going to result, and these are mice, proof of principle uh, studies in mice, this is going to result mainly antibodies against the head that is immunodominant, but also a small amount of antibodies and B cell memory against the stem. Then we continue that with a another chimeric hemagglutinin that now uh, is the, it has the head of H5 and the same stem from, from H3. And this is gonna again induce again a primary response against the head, but now it's a primary response because the head is so different that they are very, uh, there are almost no common epitopes between these two heads. So this is still an immunodominant response, but it's a primary response, but because it has the same stem, this is gonna now boost the response is this small amount of B cell memory that is induced by the first chimeric. It's gonna boost it and result in more antibodies against the stem. And then we continue with another chimeric hemagglutinin. In this case, the total H3 protein, the stem of H3. And so it's not chimeric, but, but has a, a completely different head. 
And then after doing these three immunizations, then we do a challenge in mice with a subtype H7 and 9 that is completely different from any of the heads of these hemagglutinins, but it's from group 2 hemagglutinins. And when we do that, and when we do this vaccination approach, we can protect mice from disease, we can protect mice from death, while the controls are dying from H7 and 9 infection. But not only against um, H7, we can protect against H10, and these are tires in lungs, and we, we achieve around two logs uh, reduction in viral replication in vaccinated animals. H10, that is also a group 2HA. H3, um, either from swine H3 or human H3. And in this case, we, in, instead of doing the vaccination with H3, we do the vaccination with uh, an H7 chimeric protein. So these animals have never seen these hemagglutinins. Despite of that, with this protocol of immunization, they are protected against um, challenge with these different subtypes from group 2 influenza A virus. Now, this is, um, at least we know that, although there could be also some cellular immunity that is being induced by our immunogens, we know that a passive transfer of sera will mediate protection, so the antibody response that is induced is protective, and then we take the, the sera from these mice, and then we transfer to new mice that are not vaccinated, and we challenge with H3 and 2, we get protection in these mice. So this is for group 2, but if we challenge with a group 1, we don't, we don't get uh, uh, protection. But can we repeat the same thing with group 1? And just um, a little bit faster here, because it's the same protocol, but now we use a chimeric hemagglutinins that have H1 stem, and then a, a exotic head like H9, H6, and H5. And then finally, we, ch we challenge with an H1 and 1 virus, again, completely different hemagglutinin from the ones in terms of the head, from the ones that I've seen here, but having a stem that is the same stem that is shared by the chimeric hemagglutinins. And again, what we get is protection against body weight loss, protection against uh, mortality, and uh, also heterosubtypic uh, protection against group 1 influenza virus like H5 or H6. So with that, we cover um, all group 1 and group 2 influenza viruses. Um, these uh, levels of protection are related to the levels of antibodies that are induced by vaccination, by ELISA, as measured by ELISA, against the stem of the hemagglutinin. And again, passive transfer is able to mediate protection. All right, so this is a proof of concept. This one we are using just hemagglutinins in mice, but we think that if we go now into for future studies, and especially for humans, that it's much better to go with a strategy that in addition to inducing stem antibodies against the CHE, will induce also cellular immune responses and antibodies against the neuraminidase, which is another sub-dominant um, protein in the virus for which antibodies against the protein are more cross-reactive than antibodies against the head of the chain. And because of that, we came with this strategy that we tested first in ferrets, which is based in life attenuated as well as inactivated vaccine platforms for influenza virus. Again, a collaboration between Florian Kramer, my group, and Peter Palese. And here are the vaccine that we try, and this time was in ferrets, that is considered a better model for influenza virus vaccination. Is, um, is based on the following. We first prime the ferrets with a chimeric, with an influenza B virus that express an influenza virus chimeric protein from group one stem. And the reason we do that is to mimic some pre-existing immunity, a small amount of pre-existing immunity against the stem of the hemagglutinin without having any other pre-existing immunity against any other antigens of influenza A virus. So this is just to mimic a stem pre-existing immunity in this, in this uh, Animals, this induced very little levels of stem antibodies. But now we go and then we put the vaccine, which is sequential immunization with a life attenuated virus that is based in the call adapted Russian vaccine that contains a chimeric hemagglutinin, which is, contains the H1 stem, H8 head, following now by a boost with an inactivated vaccine with the same stem and now the head is different, H5, that is adjuvanted, and this is in collaboration with GSK with uh, ASO3. And we have another group in which we use life, followed it by life, this chimeric hemagglutinin. So this one is life, followed it by the activated, adjuvanted, life, followed it by life. We have a control group that is not vaccinated. We have another control group that includes a single dose of trivalent vaccine. And then we have a completely naive uh, ferret. So if we look to a stock titus using an antigen that has a different head, but the same stem, so the only an antibodies they find is against the stem of the hemagglutinin find that uh, vaccination with trivalent vaccines induce undetectable levels of um, 
of um, antibodies against the stem. Also, this uh, pre-existing immunity um, that we induce first with an influenza B virus also induce very little amount, not detectable levels of the stem antibodies. But now in our two modalities, inactivated <coughs> plus inactivated or life attenuated plus inactivated, we can see, especially after the second boost, we can see nice levels now of the stem antibodies against group one hemagglutinins. But not only that, and especially we use life attenuated that contains much more levels of neuraminidase than inactivated vaccine. We also see a nice induction now of antibodies against the neuraminidase, which uh, again, that we think is because now this neuraminidase that before was subdominant is being boosted twice with using this chimeric hemagglutinin. Now, if now we take these animals and we challenge with H1 and 1, and again, these, these animals, they were not immunized with an H1 immunogen containing H1 head. The only thing that they was there is the stem of the H1. Now we look to uh, tyres in trachea, nasal turbinase, or bronchia. We find that in the lower respiratory tract, um, the life plus life is, is reducing dramatically the levels of, of, uh, of replication, both in bronchia and trachea. The life followed by inactivated is reducing el, el some levels, but not as good as life plus life. And also in the nasal turbinase, you get a nice reduction that will be then, this will be for disease, and this will be for transmission, nasal turbinase, you get a nice reduction of the levels of replication of the virus. So this was the, the experiments that we did before going into a clinical trial. We are conducting now this clinical trial with uh, the Gates um, funding using the same protocol that you are using here, but we are using inac inactivated followed by inactivated versus alive followed by inactivated. And uh, we will get the results uh, from this clinical trial, which is only at this moment safety and immunogenicity, uh, most likely around uh, two months or three months from now. The people have been already immunized, and we are, getting, we are starting to collect the data, and there are two different cohorts that have been, uh, where these clinical trials have been conducted. But what I've shown you is that, yes, if we will be ferrets, we will be okay. We have already universal vaccine. So either we become ferrets or we try to get this vaccine to work in, uh, in animals. And the other thing I want to say is that the use of a life attenuated or adjuvants, in addition to induce these levels, are focused mainly on the levels of stem antibodies. But we didn't find a difference in levels of stem antibodies between life, life, and attenuated, and life um, inactivated. Despite that, life, life worked it better. And that could be because of mucosal immunity, or it could be because of better cellular immunity against conserved antigens, which you will expect also from this uh, vaccine. And just to acknowledge the people, um, this is um, where our labs are located in Mount Sinai. And uh, again, collaboration between Florian and Peter. We are also now collaborating with Rafi and Patrick Wilson to try to understand better the antibody responses in humans induced by these vaccinations. And some other people that are involved in these studies in my labs, Randy, Michael, Angela, and Juan, and Rafael Nazpower, which is a postdoc that is being shared between Peter and Florian. Thanks a lot.